It, uh, it's really nice to see so many of you out here so early on a beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, it's uh, quite positive. Often Sunday mornings it takes a while for people to straggle in, but this is great, first thing. Uh, my name is Ricardo Acuna. <laughs> I'm a staff member at the Parkland Institute and um, really thrilled to be here today to introduce our speaker for this morning. Before doing so, I want to go through some requisite announcements. First of all, just to remind you that uh, after this session uh, and throughout the day, we'll be serving fair trade coffee and tea at the, the link space over there. Uh, if you haven't brought your own mug, we've got disposable cups there, which you can purchase for $2. Um, also, I know most of you have been here through most of the weekend, if not all of the weekend, and you've gotten a sense for some of the work that Parkland is doing and some of the role that we're doing to bring people together um, in Edmonton, in Alberta, to have these important conversations and discussions, bringing world-class speakers to you. Um, and this doesn't happen by accident. I know often there's a misconception up there that because we're part of the university, we must be flush in money. Uh, I know you all know the reality is otherwise. Um, and as of uh, this summer, as of July 1st, it's actually working the other way now where uh, funds that uh, we gather at Parkland for our work are going to subsidize the work of the university. Uh, so um, all this to remind you that each of you has in your registration booklets, and there are more out at the Parkland table, a donation form, a pledge form. Uh, I know many of you, most of you already support us, but if you could uh, support us a little bit more, uh, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. It would make it possible for us to keep doing what we're doing. Also, we've had an incredibly busy fall at Parkland. Uh, we've put out more reports in the last month and a half than we had in the previous two years. Uh, all of them are out at our table. You can purchase them there. You can pick up the executive summaries of the reports for free. Uh, some, some fabulous, fabulous reports. I'm a little biased, but uh, I think they're fabulous reports. Uh, don't forget uh, over the course of the day today to fill out your evaluation forms. Uh, we use these to plan next year's conference, which will actually start in about two months. We'll start planning next year's conference. So please fill those out. Give us your thoughts, things we could do better, things you thought we did well. Uh, it would be wonderful. Uh, also, how many of you were at the social last night in the book reading? It was great, wasn't it? It was a lot of fun. We had a fabulous turnout. It was terrific. So I just want to do a quick shout out to uh, the Douglas and McIntyre, the publishers of Arno's book that helped to sponsor the social last night. Uh, it was great. And to all of, those, uh, all of you who came out. Finally, first thing in the morning, I want to take the opportunity to thank our many other sponsors of the conference. Uh, in alphabetical order, I want to thank uh, the Alberta Federation of Labor, Athabasca University, Bullfrog Power, the Canadian Union of Public Employees, CSU Local 52, the Confederation of Alberta Faculty Associations, the Health Sciences Association of Alberta. <laughs> Listen Louder Sound, the United Nurses of Alberta. <laughs> the University of Alberta's Faculty of Arts, the U of A Graduate Students Association and the Wordsworth Irvine Socialist Fellowship Endowment. Uh, and also take a moment to thank our media sponsors for their support, Alberta Views Magazine, View Weekly, CJSR Radio Edmonton, and CJSW Radio in Calgary. So that's it for the official announcements. Um, really, really thrilled today to have with us uh, Dr. Katie Gibbs, she is a scientist, a communicator, and an organizer who is really, really focused and passionate about the place where science and public policy intersect. She recently finished her PhD in biology at the University of Ottawa, looking at broad-scale threats to endangered species and the effectiveness of conservation measures. She's been working diligently on another uh, endangered species of sorts, which is the freedom to do research and speak about it. And that's what she's here to talk to us about today. She's the co-founder and executive director of Evidence for Democracy, an organization that advocates for the use of evidence in government decision-making and public policy development. Please welcome Katie Gibb.
Thank you. Thank you so much for that great intro. And thank you guys all for being here bright and early, especially since I hear it was a fun and rowdy social last night. Um, and thanks for, for inviting me to speak here. I've, I was able to participate in some of the talks yesterday, and I was really impressed with not only the caliber of the other speakers, but also the questions from the audience. It's nice to have such an engaged and informed audience. Um, so today I'm going to talk a bit about the intersections between evidence and democracy, as well as then taking a look at how evidence is doing in our country right now, and then talk a little bit about how some of the threats to science and evidence have led to scientists speaking out, and a little bit about what that movement has looked like. So, you know, first I'll just explore a bit this link between evidence and democracy. I'm not sure it's necessarily intuitive for a lot of people to think of science and evidence as being intrinsically linked to democracy. So this first line, no science, no evidence, no truth, no democracy, was the chant at the Death of Evidence rally that we did in July of 2012. And it's, it's so short and simple, but I think it kind of brilliantly summarizes that idea. Um, and I think somebody else came up with it, so I could say that. But it's really getting at the fact that, you know, science and evidence and the, the rigorous scientific evaluation is really one of the best ways that we have for, for knowing what's true for being able to distinguish between opinion and ideology versus what is an actual fact. And without being able to do that, we really don't know what's, what's true and what isn't. We can't distinguish between propaganda and truth. And I think without, without being able to do that, we really can't have a functioning democracy. Um, you know, certainly having a functioning democracy really requires having an informed public who knows what's going on, has the information to make up their own minds about policy decisions. And really transparency and accountability in our governments demand that when they make decisions, they present the facts that they're using to make that decision. Um, so I sort of see facts and evidence as, as a check on political power. So there's a great article from Carol Linnett in Academic Matters that uh, really summarizes, I think, my feelings of the links between science and democracy. So instead of trying to word it myself, I just sort of stole her quotes. So in the, in the absence of rigorous scientific information and an informed public, decision making becomes an exercise in upholding the preferences of those in power. And when we limit the production of scientific evidence, it creates a knowledge vacuum that inflates the power of political influence. If politicians can't point to facts in defense of their arguments, then there's nothing left but ideology to rely upon. So I think that perfectly summarizes this idea. And one last quote from Francesca Griffo, who up until very recently was at the Union of Concerned Scientists in the US as a, the head of their Science Democracy Center. And she says that science breeds the free thinking and openness to ideas that lie at the heart of a democratic society. I love that quote as well. So now I hope I've at least you know, implanted that idea that evidence and science are intrin intrinsically linked to our democracy. So now let's take a look at how evidence and thus democracy are doing in Canada right now. So I think there's three, three sort of broad areas where we have really seen um, changes and a cause for concern. So the first one is reductions in the communication of science and evidence. So a real limiting in the amount of information that's getting out to the public. The second is an erosion of our ability and our capacity to actually do science and collect evidence. And the third is a diminished role of evidence in public policy decisions. So I'll sort of go through each of these and give you a little bit of evidence um, to sort of back up those claims. So the first one around concerns about communication of science and evidence, this really started in 2007. We started to see changes to the communication policies for many departments within the federal government that were really um, restricting the ability of scientists to talk to the media and the public. And then we started to hear cases of government scientists not being allowed to talk to the media. Um, reporters were saying that they were now being directed to the comms department. 
And I've had the, the opportunity to talk to a lot of our most senior science journalists in Canada, and they've really seen a, a complete shift in the way it works. So many of these people have been around you know, for 20, 30 years, and so they have a lot of government scientists that they talk to regularly. And they just have them in their Rolodex, and you know, when they're doing a story, they just pick up the phone and call them. And it's usually the same people they've been interviewing for years. Um, and so then all of a sudden, when they try to call these same people that they've been calling for 15, 20 years, you know, the scientist had to say, I can't talk to you. You have to put in a formal request through the communications department. And then what we're seeing is, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily a strict muzzling across the board, it's that they, the journalist puts in a request and then often they just don't hear back at all. Or they'll hear back, you know, a week or two weeks after the story has gone to air because we know journalists are usually facing really tight deadlines. Or, you know, sometimes they have to submit their questions in writing and then they'll get written responses back from the scientists that have been vetted through numerous communications people. And then the last point here is, it's a bit more subtle, but I think possibly even more alarming, is that we've seen changes to the procedures for how government scientists can attend scientific conferences, as well as the policies around how they publish their research. So this is the sort of first sign that we saw of things to come. This is a change to the communications policy at Environment Canada. So you can see, just as we have one department, we should have one voice. So that really kind of summarizes the mentality, I think, that we're seeing from this government. And so basically this was saying that, that government scientists can't do their own media interviews. All media requests have to go through the central communication staff. So then we started to see three, there were three really strong cases of government scientists being muzzled. So there was Christy Miller, who did excellent work on salmon fisheries. There was Scott Dallimore, who did work on a, like 13,000 year old flood. And then um, there was another scientist who had done research on ozone holes. So in each of these cases, the scientists had published their research in the most prominent scientific journals, Science and Nature. And so of course, the Canadian journalists wanted to talk to them and you know share the story of how our scientists are doing this excellent world-class research. And they weren't able to. So they ended up putting in access to information requests after the fact and you know, found this paper trail of where the you know, internal government reports showing that they had been prohibited from talking to the media, sometimes even as high up as the Privy Council office was making the decision over whether or not Christy Miller could speak to the media, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So some groups started to speak out about this as far back as 2010, the Canadian Science Writers Association wrote a letter to the government um, asking them to stop muzzling our scientists. This got a lot of attention in, in nature and the, the international media has really been talking a lot about this. It's really what's happening here is, is quite different from the way it works in, in almost every other country. And so, you know, even internationally, it has been a really big story of what is happening in Canada. So I talked a little bit about the changes to how papers are published. So at DFO just this year, there's been even more changes that make it harder for scientists to publish papers. So it, it used to be the case that, you know, you only had to follow the internal publication procedure if the DFO scientist was the lead author on a paper. And then they changed the rules so that if the DFO scientist is just one of the scientists on the paper, they still have to go through the internal DFO rules. So even if it's an academic scientist who's the you know, lead scientist on it, but collaborating with the DFO scientist, and you know, he or she may only be one of five scientists on the paper, it still then has to go through the internal hurdles. So as you can imagine, that's really gonna limit the amount of collaboration that outside scientists are gonna to wanna to do with DFO because then they worry that their research may not be able to get out if the DFO manager decides that they don't want to publish that paper. And additionally, there was a new check put in place so that even after you submit your research to a peer-reviewed journal, it gets accepted, then you get sort of the, the final copyright paperwork to sign off on. 
And so that always used to be the DFO scientist who would sign off on that. And those rules have changed so that that now has to be a DFO manager who signs off on the paper even after it's already gone through peer review. So there's concern there that that may be um, used as another way to sort of stop that research from getting out if it's unpalatable for whatever reason. So earlier this year, um, a group sent some information to the Information Commissioner, essentially asking her to investigate whether or not these new rules were even legal under the Access to Information request. And the Information Commissioner has said that there is at least enough grounds there to launch an investigation into it. So that's, that is the good news, that the Information Commissioner is actually looking into this. But then this story came out uh, a few weeks ago saying the information commissioner said that she is so completely overwhelmed by the number of complaints that she's received against this government that she just doesn't even have the resources to look into all of the complaints. So I'm not holding my breath that we're going to see a response anytime soon. Uh, again, you know, the international attention to this, this was a New York Times editorial just from September on how Canada is silencing our scientists and they sort of related what's happening here to what happened in the US, except they noted that things are way worse in Canada than they ever were under George W. Bush in the US. Um, and the one quote here is great, this is more than an attack on academic freedom. It is an attempt to guarantee public ignorance. Yeah. So then, uh, just about a month ago, PIPS, the union that represents federal uh, government scientists, did a, a survey of their members and found that 90% of the scientists that responded felt that they could not speak freely to the media about their research. So this really shows that it's not just a few sort of anecdotes, it really is systematic. And here's a bit more stats from that report that were really quite um, shocking. And this, this infographic is actually from Nature. So it's still getting so much international attention what's happening in Canada. So, you know, for example, 86% of the respondents felt that they could not report actions that might harm the public without fear of being reprimanded. 48% uh, had seen information withheld, causing the public or government to be misled or misinformed. Um, and 37% had actually been blocked themselves from answering media requests in the past five years. So this really shows that it is, it is absolutely a systematic problem across the board. So now on to the second sort of area of concern about the erosion of our actual capacity to do science and collect evidence. So starting in 2009, we started to see reduced budgets for science and technology. We also started to see the closure of a whole list of really, really important scientific and evidence gathering institutions. The Experimental Lakes Area, Pearl, the Long Form Census, the National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy, and many, many, many more. This is just, I've picked some of my favorites. Um, as well, what we're seeing is the money that is still there is being, almost all of it is going towards applied research, industry partnerships, commercialization, with very little funding left for sort of basic research, curiosity-driven research, and environmental monitoring. So this just sort of summarizes the funding cuts that we've seen to the Tri-Council. So these are the groups that the government funds and then they fund a lot of academic research. And you can see across the board there's been sort of between 6 to 10 percent cuts since 2007 to 2012. And SHRC, which is sort of the social scientist, has been cut the most, but really cuts across the board. So the Experimental Lakes area, you guys have probably all heard about it. Um, it's, I think, one of the, the best examples of a cut that just didn't make any sense. So it's, a, it's a, a whole bunch of small lakes in northern Ontario in northern Manitoba where scientists can conduct studies on an entire lake. So they can do an experiment on an entire lake. And the research that has been done there has been really crucial for uh, solving problems related to acid rain and how detergents were affecting our water supply. Um, and so they had their funding cut in May of 2012 
And Diane Orahel, who was recently featured in Nature, you know, she put her PhD on hold. She was doing her PhD at the ELA, and she put her PhD on hold and just led, you know, a whole sort of campaign around saving the ELA. And it at least looks like that is the one success story, hopefully. It's still not completely saved, but we're at least getting there. Um, there was the National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy. In this in this case, it was really interesting because John Baird, in a rare moment of candor, actually said that he was cutting their funding because he didn't like the evidence or he didn't like what they were suggesting. So, yeah, and this you know this really fits into Muneer's talk last night because so one of the things that they suggested was that a carbon tax would be a really you know beneficial way to help the environment and the economy. So they put, put out a report you know, with that evidence, and uh, John Baird's response to that was, you know, why should we be funding a group that is suggesting policies against what the government wants to do? But of course, we know that that, that is the whole point of having you know, science and evidence is, you know, it is to challenge our current thoughts, and that's how we improve and get further ahead. So that's a little frustrating. So uh, about the shifting of the funding away from basic research, you know, this, this really hasn't even been stealthy at all. They've been very clear about, um, for the, with the National Research Council, they have said that they are going to refocus it to serve business. Um, so Gary Goodyear was the, the former Minister of State for Science and Technology, and he said that he envis envisions the National Research Council becoming a concierge service that offers a single phone number to connect businesses to all their research and development needs. Um, and the second quote is from John McDougall, who is the president of the National Research Council, who said that scientific discovery is not valuable unless it has commercial value. So that's telling. Um, and here again is this shift away from basic science getting international uh, attention because it is just so out of line from what other countries are doing. So the third example of concerns over the sort of reduced role of evidence in public policy decisions. So we've seen a growing list of examples where policy decisions are just completely inconsistent with what the evidence suggests. And Munir's talk last night or yesterday afternoon gave a few really great examples of that. Um, we've also seen a growing list of decisions to abandon the collection of scientific evidence based on very weak rationale. He also went through that example, which was great. And we've also seen a bunch of changes to legislation that sort of reduces the role of evidence and puts more power just in sort of ministerial discretion. So Insight is another great example. There's um, the Insight Clinic in Vancouver. Um, there's a lot of evidence to support Insight programs that they, you know, actually lower our healthcare costs and things like that. Um, but Harper has tried to actually get the one in Vancouver closed, and I believe he's he hasn't been successful in that. But I believe he has put in place some new federal um, laws that make it pretty much impossible for any other city to open an Insight program. I know in Ottawa, there's a group of doctors that are trying really hard to get one open there, and it looks like that probably won't happen. Um, another great example of lack of evidence in policy decisions is the mandatory minimum sentencing. So, you know, it might seem like it might make sense. Okay, we want to reduce crime. Let's introduce mandatory minimum sentencing. But there's a lot of evidence that suggests that this doesn't actually reduce crime. It's very expensive and it's just not effective. Um, but that is the policy that the government has put forward. And uh, what I find funny is that even the Texas, you know, they tried this in Texas. And even they realized that this didn't work, and they have, you know, since uh, gone away from these policies. So, you know, that's pretty bad when even Texas is sort of looking at what we're doing and being like, well, what are you guys doing? And of course, the census decision, I won't go through that too much, but, you know, we have, we have seen the results of the, the new national household survey start to be released, and, you know, everybody is saying they're pretty much useless. 
Um, a lot of groups that I've talked to just don't use them anymore. They're just finding other ways to get the numbers that they need because um, they're just completely useless. So a few of the examples where we've seen actual legislative changes, both of these were in the omnibus budget bill in May of 2012. So we saw changes to the Fisheries Act that changed the way fish habitat was protected. The second example is around the um, Environmental Assessment Act. So in that omnibus budget bill, they completely got rid of our old Environmental Assessment Act and put in a completely new Environmental Assessment Act that has a much uh, more limited scope. So it just outlines some specific types of projects that require an environmental assessment. Um, and anything that's not on that list does not need an environmental assessment. So there's a case too where you know, there used to have to be this you know, very rigorous assessment to see what the effects would be before we decided to go ahead with a project and now we're just not, not even doing that process. And I think at the time that actually stopped about 3,000 environmental assessments that were underway in Canada that were just stopped and no longer needed to be done. So this has uh, led to the scientific community becoming more vocal and active. So this is also a bit about the story of how I came to be here and involved in these issues. So I was finishing up my PhD at the University of Ottawa in sort of spring of 2012. And you know, during my time there, I think I was a little bit of the rabble rouser on the floor. I was often the one, you know, going to protests or putting out posters or leafleting for various causes and uh, very few other people in the department were engaged in these sort of activities. But then in May, when we saw the omnibus budget bill that came in that had a whole bunch of these changes and also had the, the loss of funding for the experimental lakes area, it was really interesting to see it was actually the professors on my floor who sort of came to me and said, we need, we need to organize something, you know, let's have a meeting at the pub to figure out what to do. So it really seemed to be, you know, enough was enough. And I think that the, the light switched and they realized that if they didn't speak out for science and its important role in society and our democracy, nobody else was going to. So, you know, I guess that's the only good thing that I think has come from this is it really has um, woken up the scientific community. So we did this rally, it was in July of 2012. You know, we, we expected maybe a few hundred people. We ended up getting a few thousand. It was just uh, far beyond what we had expected. The media attention was huge, lots of tons of national and international media attention. Again, it was covered in nature. Um, I think this was a really great quote as well. Governments come and go, but scientific expertise and experience cannot be chopped and changed as the mood suits and still be expected to function, nor can applied research thrive when basic research is struggling. If the Harper government has a valid strategic reason to undermine vital sectors of Canadian science, then they should say so. And of course, we have yet to hear that rationale. So after, after the rally, we you know, were approached by a lot of people asking what's next. And we, of course, at the time hadn't thought of that because we were just expecting to have a small little event with maybe 100 people. And so we ended up forming Evidence for Democracy, which is a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization advocating for science and evidence-based policy in Canada. So our vision, you know, it's kind of, you know, blue sky of what we would love to see, but we, we would love to see strong policies that are built on the best available evidence for the benefit of all Canadians, a thriving democracy where citizens are informed and engaged and all levels of government are transparent and accountable, and a national culture that values science and evidence and the important role that they play in our society. So, you know, this is what we're working to in the, the long, long term. So I, I sort of see ourselves as half, half think tank doing sort of independent research, but then also taking that research and going the next step and doing campaigns around it. So part of what we're doing is monitoring what the government is doing and trying to actually document that. Because really, you know, it's, 
we want to actually have evidence to make the claims that we're making. Whereas people don't really monitor evidence-based decision making or even the communication policies of the government. So we want to start actually monitoring that in a rigorous way so that we can actually, when there are changes, we can better document it and actually have evidence to back up the claims that we're making. We also then hope to take that information and use it to, to educate the public on why science matters, why evidence in decision making matters, and then you know, actually take actions on specific issues, whether that's you know, organizing rallies or petitions or things like that. So again, we, we hope to foster a constructive skepticism in Canada. I know that word sort of has a bad rap now, thanks to climate skeptics, but you know, really it is just the you know, critically evaluating claims that you hear. Um, we want to ensure that the government is properly investing in public interest science and making sure that evidence isn't misrepresented in the public space. So one of the first things that we did um, since actually launching as an organization, we did a science uncensored campaign. So this is specifically focusing on the, the muzzling of government scientists. Because again, I think part of the problem with these issues is that each individual instance isn't necessarily that bad on its own, but it's when you take them all together and put them in context that it's really alarming. So we have some information there that sort of has a timeline of all of the muzzling events as well as a petition that people can sign. And then in September, we did Stand Up for Science rallies, and we, we ended up having events in 18 cities across the country. And you know, considering we're a brand new organization with almost no resources, I think that's pretty good. And we've also had a really, really great media coverage, I find um, kind of surprising given the few resources that we have. So I think, I think because the media has sort of been affected by this, they're more willing to cover it. So for what's next, we're, one of the things we're doing is working on building a network of experts. So th these are part of the, we sort of want these people to be our eyes and ears to help us you know, monitor and document what's going on and alert us to when there's cuts in their area or decisions that are being made that totally go against what the facts say. Um, we're also developing a sort of online educational resource for Canadians that documents what we've seen so far in the last few years. So again, it's, you know, so much has happened and there really isn't one place that you can go to kind of get up to speed on what has happened and what it means. So we're hoping to put that together. And then on the more policy side is we're working on sort of facilitating a process where we get together with a bunch of different groups working on these issues and try to formulate um, what policies we actually want to see. So we're tentatively calling this a science charter. Um, so our hope is to have this finished by the end of 2014, and then that is something that can be used you know, during the next election. We can ask candidates and party leaders to sort of sign on and endorse the science charter. So again, we're a brand new organization, so we absolutely need your help. You can join our mailing list, you can join our network of experts, you can volunteer with us. We're, we are also looking for partners for events and research projects. So, for example, at SFU in BC, um, one of our supporters there approached his department about getting a research assistant position to help us, so, and they agreed. So now we have you know, some of this research that we want to do is going to be done as a research project for a research assistant in the next semester. Um, so that's a great way to partner with us, as well as, you know, for events. We, we may want to do events in Edmonton, so we're always looking for partners to help cover venue costs and all that kind of stuff. And of course, like all of us, uh, funding is our limiting factor at this point. So we are absolutely looking for donors if you support the work that we're doing. And so all of those things that I just mentioned, you can do them at evidencefordemocracy.ca. We're also on Facebook, and we're about five followers away from a thousand on Twitter. So if you're on Twitter, go and follow us so that we can break the 1,000 mark today. Um, yeah, so that's it for me, and I really look forward to hearing your guys' questions and feedback.
All right, thank you so much, Katie. That was terrific. Um, you know, we often hear at the conference, uh, people say, oh, you guys present so many problems and we don't get to hear enough about what people are doing to make a difference. So it's great uh, to have you here and show us something concrete that uh, is being done. I'm going to uh, scan the room for hands. I see one up at the very back in the middle there. I'm going to make the mic runners run. They need their Sunday morning exercise. <laughs> yeah, back in the middle. Back there, yes. I'm curious if you could speak a little bit about the Canadian Food Agency and a lot about the recalls that are happening with food and all of the evidence base around that because I think that that hits more home to general people. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I, I mean, I don't really have the, the stats offhand for how many um, scientists we've lost in that department, but that's exactly it, is we want to take the, you know, we have lost a huge number of government scientists. And I think most Canadians don't really know what that means to them. And I think that's a really great example of where you can really link it back to, you know, those government scientists were making sure that your food supply is safe. And so, you know, when we cut them and they have a much reduced capacity to, to monitor those things, it can put you at risk. I'm gonna, right here, perfect. I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, one of the areas I wanted to ask about was, uh, uh, it, it's probably gonna be a real challenge for you to get uh, charitable funding status because you have an advocacy and the rules seem to prevent organizations like yourself from getting charitable status. So that's, I just wanted you to comment on that uh, challenge. Yeah, it, it is a challenge. Uh, we've been sort of debating that a lot internally. And it's been frustrating too because I've been talking a lot to the Union of Concerned Scientists in the U.S. and their rules are totally different. Um, our charitable rules in Canada are quite antiquated where, you know, it's very much still this sort of idea of a charity as like, you know, a food bank or a soup kitchen and that kind of thing. And there really isn't any place for an advocacy organization. Whereas in the U.S., a lot of they can still do a lot of advocacy, even with their charitable rules there. So it is it is a challenge for sure. I'm going to yeah, okay, let's go with in the middle there. And can I ask the mic runners to make sure you turn your mics off when you're not? Yeah, uh, Katie, you've presented a talk which um, focused on the um, muzzling of scientists after the fact, that is, after the research has been done. Uh, do you have any evidence that there has been uh, an attempt to control the research before it starts that's over and above the cutting of budgets and uh, laying off of staff? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have anything really concrete, but that's something that we're, we're working with PIPS to investigate a bit more. So there was a few questions in their survey about, you know, whether or not their science had been affected by political reasons, and a lot of people responded yes. So that's something that we're going to investigate further. Um, I haven't really heard any concrete examples of scientists sort of not being able to publish their research and that sort of thing. Although if you look at the number of publication rates for the National Research Center, that has declined over the last few years. So just sort of the metric of number of publications. But I haven't seen any stats of the sort of number of publications from government scientists as a whole. Um, but one thing we definitely have seen is a huge limitation on their ability to attend conferences. Um, and we're trying to sort of quantify that right now, but that has a huge effect on their ability to actually do science. Um, as, I don't know if you know, people here are really familiar with it, but at a scientific conference, is, that's really where you're, you're finding out about the really current research, the new ideas, that's where you're forming collaborations, and pretty much it's almost impossible for government scientists to attend conferences right now. I've heard of people being denied, even if they're willing to pay their own money to go, or they have external funding, their request still gets denied. Go 
okay, good, now working. Um, I really like the talk. I think that uh, it's incredibly important that we're discussing this sort of thing. Um, but I think that the people here are already on, generally on side with that. So, and I think that when I try and talk about this sort of stuff, I like to think that the true test of the quality of my points is, is somebody who isn't already agreeing with me, are they going to agree with me? Are they going to, are we going to be able to bring people to our side by talking about this? So my question is, when, I don't know if you've done this or if you put much thought into this, I know some people don't, some people do. When you enter a room of people who aren't already on side, does the way that you present these arguments, does it change? Uh, maybe not necessarily hostile audience or a con rabid conservative audience, but people who aren't necessarily already on side or people who don't necessarily, um, I don't want to say believe in science, but believe that this is a serious problem. How do you, how do you deal with that as an audience? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I think you, already the tone of the presentation is not very political or rabid, you know? It's not, oh, Harper's War on Science and things like that. Because I think, I think if you approach it that way, it can turn people off who are sort of more, you know, in the middle, haven't made up their mind. So I'm not sure I would change too much. Um, but certainly the sort of online educational website that we're working on, that one is going to be more, you know, really geared to linking each of these. So this is more of a summary of what's happening. Whereas, you know, if I was talking to a more general public, I would be making more of the links between each of these things and why it affects them. So, you know, those examples of your food safety, the examples with experimental lakes area and, you know, the lake behind your cottage that you swim in. Um, so it's more, it's not so much changing the way this is presented. I think it's just going the next step further in why they should care about it. All right, so we're going to go here and then we're going to come down here to... Oh, and I have breaking news. Someone told me you have 1,011 followers on Twitter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. Just before you start, Cecily, I do want to remind folks, I see your hands. I'm working very hard to get a diversity of speakers. And if I see new voices that I haven't seen ask anything yet at the conference, I will default to those first. I was wondering if Parks Canada is also being muzzled. For example, this week on Tuesday, we have um, a meeting about the Meline Lake Hotel. And it sounds to me more like a PR opportunity for Brewster than an actual hearing where we have the right to give an opinion about this project. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know much about that specific example. Um, I haven't heard many muzzling examples from Parks Canada, but I've, I've mostly just heard that they've been hugely cut. Um, I mean, they just, they don't really have even any people left to muzzle, so. <laughs> Katie, thank, thank you for what you've uh, been saying and, and for what you are doing, because I think it's very important. Um, and I understand why, um, in order to bring people in and so on, um, we continue to talk about being non nonpartisan. But the fact is, <laughs> that's a terrible phrase, because that's one that Harper uses all the time when he's lying. But um, uh, what... It is a political issue. It, it is something the Harper government is doing, and it's very political uh, to muzzle scientists. And uh, so in order to, con to counter that, um, it's going to need to be uh, partisan. Uh, it's going to, you're going to need to name the parties that would be willing to actually make sure that scientists have the right to speak um, and to point out that that is not the conservative way. Uh, Otherwise, it kind of allows people to say, yeah, I'm concerned about that, but I'll still vote conservative. Yeah, so, I mean, one, I, I do think that this issue, I do think it is a non-partisan issue. I think what we've seen from this government has been particularly bad, but I don't think previous governments have been all that much better. Um, I have heard cases of muzzling started even before Harper came to power. Um, certainly cuts to scientific budgets, I've heard I'm quite young, so my, you know, my experience doesn't go back that far, but I've heard, um, you know, under Cretchen and Martin uh, is really when we started to see declines in funding for science. So, you know, I, I do think that for all political parties, it's always more convenient for them to, 
make decisions based on ideology or political convenience instead of the facts. So, you know, it's kind of where I, I do see this as sort of a more important and broader movement than just, you know, oh, we need to get rid of the current government. I think even, you know, future governments, whether they're also conservative or not, are going to need, you know, the public and an advocacy organization to really hold them accountable to evidence-based decision-making. Um, so our, our plans for sort of in the next election are to work with a number of groups to create the science charter that I mentioned. So, you know, that's essentially going to be like a science platform. Like these are the policies that we want to see that would make, you know, really strong, transparent public science in Canada, strong evidence-based policy in Canada. And then, you know, we can encourage people to, the different candidates and the party leaders to endorse that. And I think, you know, based on who and who does not endorse that science charter, um, the Canadians who want to vote based on this issue will be able to make their decision based off that. We've got one up there. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, this is going back to the NRC and the, the scientists that are working that are currently there. And I like to think that some of them still want to do ethical and uh, liberal and open research. Are there uh, venues for them? I was thinking of underground scientists uh, collectives uh, that are going on that you know of that they could still have a voice because I would think they hear and learn of things that they want to uh, disseminate. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think that's something that people don't understand either that it's for scientists, they're usually, I mean, they're generally so passionate about the research they're doing, and that's why they got into it. And it's really hard to just ask them to switch topics to something else. Like you just, you can't just switch that passion and enthusiasm to a different topic. It doesn't work that way, because um, there is that sort of creative element to science that only really flourishes when you're doing something that you're passionate about. Um, I haven't really heard of anything like you mentioned, and I think that's that's part of the frustration around them not being able to attend conferences, because that's really where they would be forming those those networks. So yeah, unfortunately, I, I haven't really heard anything like that. Okay, I've got one way up at the top. Hi. Sorry, it's Chucky. I just want to put an analogy out there before I put my question out there. Lots of people, for personally, I've worked for a tyrannical boss before at a, at a job. And if I work for such a tyrannical boss, and, uh, and, I di and he knows I disagree with him, and, he, and then for me to be, you know, maybe shunted aside, or maybe my, the budget for my department gets reduced, or he doesn't listen to my viewpoint, or I feel a bit persecuted, I think anyone who works in that situation understands that. Oh, okay, the boss is a bit of a jerk, and, I kind of get pushed aside. My question is, why in the bigger picture of the government that has power, that is almost directly analogous to what I just said, why is it so difficult for us to understand that this is what they're doing and this is their agenda? And why does it take so much uh, convincing of people such as ourselves that this is the motivation behind cutting budgets and muzzling scientists and pushing them to the margins and silencing uh, different opinions. It just, it's almost like we can't grasp the blatantly obvious and I'm wondering why you feel that there needs to be so much convincing of what's a fairly obvious situation. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it goes back to what I said about, you know, it's only really so powerful when you put all of those pieces into context and, and I think, you know, I really think that that's why our first Death of Evidence rally got the response it did, because I don't really think up until then those threads had been tied together. I think it really kind of shifted that narrative into this, you know, larger picture of the Death of Evidence type thing. Because if you just, you know, if you're just following the news and you see these little tidbits, none of them are particularly alarming on their own. It really is only if you put them in context. And, you know, if you think most people are busy, they're absorbed in their daily lives, they might just hear little bits of this, um, you know, and it's a story that's played out since 2007, that's a long time frame, so that's, you know, that's really where we're trying to kind of weave all these webs together and sort of put them all in that bigger picture. 
Okay, Annika, you're gonna get to ask your question. And then uh, the person in the green right here on the aisle. Thank you so much for coming here. I, I feel hopeful. You did a tremendous job that you documented evil step by step. That is tremendous. Even Machiavelli would agree with that. You have to know your enemy. So that, that is fantastic because I thought, oh, I know it all, I know it all. No, to see it all listed, now I can start fighting. Now I have a question. In the past, when I was, I'm still a water crusader, at one time I was told, don't speak out so loudly, Anneke, your husband will lose your job. So, you give hope to people who individually fight for issues. That's fantastic. My question is, how can you bridge that gap? A lot of people in my street, I'm talking about the people in my street, they're still sleeping right now, but politically they're sleeping forever. How to bridge that gap to understand what science does and how it relates to democracy? Because if you can kind of figure out a nice, uh, wonderful biting comments or you know, little graphic illustrations, then you know, we can bring it to the masses and we maybe even get rid of a fascist government. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well... And soon. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad you learned something new because I was a little worried that this would all be redundant for an audience this educated. But what's funny too is this is only a tidbits of it. There is still, there's a long list of things that I didn't even touch on. Um, so we, again, that's, I mean, that's exactly what we're trying to figure out how to do is how to communicate these issues in a way that you can really get people on board with them. And, you know, I was in the session yesterday about communicating and we kind of discussed a little bit about it I think it's about trying to communicate that science and rational thought are a value for Canadians because I do think that they are I you know I especially think to when George W Bush was in power and I there was that real sense of being proud that we were smarter than them and we weren't ideology based and um, I'm, I'm trying to tap into that sentiment because I do think it's there so yeah, I don't I don't have all the answers yet, but that's essentially what we're trying to figure out. Okay, over here on the aisle. Uh, Katie, thank you for your talk and your work. I'm just wondering uh, if it's affected your career. It's probably not a career booster in your field. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, you know, I really thank you for your sacrifice. But uh, how is that going? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, I've also, I, I'm friends with Diane Orahel as well, who sort of led the ELA campaign, and it's something we've talked about a lot. And it, it is a bit risky for young scientists to kind of take this on. And I guess it is a little bit frustrating too. I think um, it would be nice to see more of the, you know, tenure track, very secure professors sort of leading the charge more because um, I think they're sort of in more of a comfortable position to be able to do that. On the other hand, though, you know, it really does feel like the, the next generation of scientists, the younger scientists, the people I went to grad school with, it's, it's completely ingrained in them to want to speak out, and it's natural for them to engage in advocacy and, you know, communicate their science with the public. So I think, I think it's going to get easier. As, as time goes on, as you know, the grad students today sort of become the scientists of tomorrow, because I think they're more just you know completely open to that idea of, of doing advocacy. For myself, you know, I've probably I I think I've given up on the idea of a standard you know academic career. Um, I'm really you know the ivory tower and just publishing my research and nobody reading it. You know that was something that frustrated me even before I started doing this, especially because my, my research was on conservation biology and you know that was something that really frustrated me even then was that it didn't really feel like the research was getting used. So I think, you know, at least for now, I think my career is going to be more about this sort of science advocacy and you know, trying to actually get the science used. So we've got one up here. Um, you were mentioning the science charter, and when I look at the anti-intellectual um, um, uh, sentiment that's just been 
um, fanned for, for now a number of years, or the um, the argument that, oh, the, the, the census was a, a privacy issue and there were two complaints. So related to your science charter and connecting to the question that was up here, one of my concerns would be that the charter, as we're moving into the next election, um, gets so distilled that the average public person can't recognize um, exactly what you were saying, that we have to connect it to issues that matter every day in Canadians' lives. So I just wanted to hear a little bit about your vision for that science charter being a document that doesn't distill and disconnect uh, to the extent that the public won't recognize uh, what it is, that the, the worthy goals that you're, that you're moving towards. So could you just speak to that a little bit, how a document like that could work? Yeah, it's a good question. And that's sort of where I see the two as being uh, I see the science charter as being sort of the more the more academic policy uh, related endeavor. So you know, actually coming up with the specific policies that we want, you know, that is something that is a little bit more nerdy and less approachable for the average person. So the actual creation of that document and the document itself, I think, probably will be out of reach for most you know the average Canadian. But then there will be sort of a campaign around it and what it means to the average person. So the charter itself is, is the nitty gritty policy details that we want to see. But then you can do a sort of you know, public outreach campaign around why it matters, which is the question that most Canadians care about. Not the policy details, but why it matters to them. Seeing so we're gonna come right on the third row here on the aisle. Katie, uh, keep a strong backbone. You're going to need it, is just my humble advice. My question to you is, with your personal doctorate uh, research, could Idle No More use that? Uh, with conservation and our planet? Uh, probably not, so... <laughs> no, that's fine. I just yeah. wanted to know uh, for an outlet for it. Yeah. That's fine. Good. Okay. <laughs> Seen a hand right in the middle over there, and then we're gonna go. Seen we're gonna go to the end over there. Katie, thank you so much. Uh, I, this this is something I've particularly been watching over the years, and and. Uh, I, I just wanted to suggest my obsession is elder care. Mm -hmm. One of the problems there is pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. The overprescribing, the improper prescribing, the absence of, of safety checks when they're approved, the absence of aftermarket follow-up. And I'm wondering, because I understand that those resources have been cut as well, and I, I also understand that the standards for approving drugs or the standards for saying they're a problem are incredibly weak. And I'm wondering if there's anyone in your organization that has expertise in that field, because I think that's going to become more and more an issue. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, right now, it's not really something we've been focusing on, mostly just as a capacity issue. We're still sort of growing and trying to increase our capacity. Um, but we did partner with, uh, I think it's Canadian Doctors for Medicare, for a campaign that they did to try to save the BC Therapeutics Initiative out in BC, which is um, a group that essentially does independent assessments of whether or not drugs are actually effective and does independent education for doctors. Um, so it's really great because it's one of the only sort of w ways that uh, med students get independent research on drugs instead of just research from the drug companies. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a crucial issue and something we, we hope to be able to expand into. Go ahead. Um, so we've been talking mostly about the government sector, but I know um, many, if not most of us here at the University of Alberta have also been experiencing um, kind of the effect of this type of ideology. So I was wondering just to put our experience in context, if you could speak a little bit to um, 
kind of what has been happening at other universities across Canada in terms of cuts to base funding or prioritization of funding towards applied research? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, even in terms of government science, like still most academics, I would say, get their funding from the government through those, those funding councils. So the one chart that I put up showing funding um, for the, the three different funding councils, so that really was cuts to academic research, not cuts to actual government science. Um, so we've seen that cut about 10%, I guess 7 to 10% across the board. Um, certainly the other issue is um, sort of corporate influence on research on universities and you know I know I think there was a talk here about that as well it's not something I'm an expert on but you know I think part of it is when we have sort of more more corporately funded research that's for me that's even more reason why we need to have the strong public science and that's the kind of science that the government should be doing um, you know the example that I always use is you're not going to get tobacco companies funding research to show that secondhand smoke is harmful. You know, that's the kind of research that the government has to be doing um, because no corporation is going to do it. Yeah, I've got one up here. Um, I was wondering, um, do you have uh, people in your group that are looking at, uh, say, the, um, the regulation side of things? Um, we've talked in this in this conference also about uh, cuts to uh, regulations and, and uh, commercialization of, of the mechanisms there and drawing on what was being talked about uh, in the in medications and stuff. Um, if, uh, if the approval processes for medications and drugs um, are so commercialized, um, the science gets terribly uh, um, modified and, and distorted mm -hmm. as a result of that. Um, that's a very serious health concern as far as I'm concerned. And uh, um, I was wondering if you have people like looking at it from the health and regulation angle. Yeah, so I, I consider that kind of more like scientific integrity, which is an issue that we're, we're hoping to sort of expand into. But looking at the science that does come out and seeing if it is, you know, pure science or if it has been um, interfered with by, by you know, pol for political reasons. Um, so it's, it's not really something that we've had the capacity to look into yet, but certainly hope to. All right. I was just sitting here thinking about other allies that we could get on board and how to get the message out. And I know my nephews have both all been to this We Day conference this past year. It's been very popular in the schools. And I know it was organized by a couple of Canadian um, fellows, mainly, I think, thinking about, you know, things happening outside of Canada um, and how we can, you know, help the world. But I wonder if you've had any contact with them or would think about um, using that venue to get to the youth on this issue? Yeah, it's not a bad idea. I haven't had any contact with them. Um, I suspect, though, that they would probably only work with registered charities, which we're not. We may be going down that route, but there's pros and cons to each, right? So that's part of where that challenge is around the, the charitable laws, and most of those groups will, I suspect, only work with charities. Um, same thing with most like foundation funding. Whereas once you get charitable status, you're really limited in any kind of, you know, not even political work, but just any kind of even completely nonpartisan advocacy is very restricted. So it's about finding that balance between getting out to a wide audience, but still not losing our ability to be effective. Okay, had the gentleman up here in the gray jacket. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, go ahead then, and then pass the mic up. And then those two will be, I think, our last two, and we'll wrap. Thank you, Katie, for a very informative and thought-provoking uh, presentation. I guess my question is around, do we as Canadians value science in our critical thinking and decision-making? If not, why not? So, so was the question, do they? I, I think so. Um, 
I, th I think I really think that they do. Um, I think we're we're trying to figure out how to tap into that. Um, you know, again, I, I think of that comparison of when George Bush was in power, and there was this kind of sense of you know smugness, and we're better than them. They're so whereas they're they can almost be you know proud of being ignorant. But I don't feel like we have that same sentiment here. We may be going more that route, but I don't think we're there yet. And so that's that's exactly what I think we need to tie into. And I, I haven't quite figured out how to tap into it or how to verbalize that, but I, I do think it's there. Check, check. Oh, it's on. Um, so the, the main thing that I wanted to ask is sort of taking this out of this room. Um, I think the, the main way that the current government has been able to keep the general population on board is they kind of tie it to the economy. Like we make these decisions to help you to pay your bills and people can understand that and support that very easily. So let's say if you were somewhere at a bus stop at a cocktail party and you explain what you're doing here and they say, well, it is, that sounds like it's gonna hurt the economy, which means I might not be able to pay my mortgage and feed my kids. What is your um, come back to that? What do you say after someone says, is this gonna hurt the economy? Well, I mean, if we're specifically talking about the economy, I mean, I would talk about the importance of, of research in driving our economy. Um, I mean, this is where I'm really concerned about how all of the existing funding is only going towards commercialization right now. So that may, you know, mean good things for our economy for the next, you know, one to five years. But the, the reality is that almost all of the technology that we use actually started as basic blue sky, curiosity driven research. So, you know, cell phones, laser technology, Velcro, MRI mach machines, almost everything started as basic research. It wasn't directed, it was just scientists doing, you know, what they were curious about. And it did end up leading towards huge commercialization. So what worries me is that we're only looking, so it's often thought of as sort of a pipeline where you have, you know, basic research sort of feeding in and then commercialization is the output. So while just focusing on commercialization, the, the end point might make sense in terms of our economy you know, in one to five years. It's incredibly short-sighted because we're, we've completely you know, turned off the tap of the basic research that feeds into that pipeline. So I think that this means really bad things for our economy in the longer term, you know, five, 10, 20 years down the road. Thank you very much. Um, I know some of you still have questions. I'm, I'm going to move towards wrapping up. I apologize I didn't get to everybody. Uh, I'm sure Katie might in, entertain uh, speaking to you one-on-one -on -one after her session. This is a, a big issue, and it's an important issue, and one that, that we're seeing here at a provincial level as well as a federal level. There were presentations yesterday about the changing language and funding structure of research at universities. I saw in the news near the end of this week that in the same week that the Center for Oil Sands Innovation here at the U of A got millions and millions of dollars, the university is starting to move to eliminating the Circumpolar Institute, which is a collaborative research project uh, that's been happening for years with other countries. So we're seeing it and it's happening and it's great that uh, we have people who are committed to science and evidence and pushing this work forward and reversing this trend like Katie. So thank you very much for your work and for speaking with us. Yeah. A small gift from Parkland for your time. Thank you so much.